I have a confession to make. Growing up, I was a Christmas critic. In fact, I had a lot more in common with the Grinch and Scrooge than I did with Tiny Tim, for sure. I didn't start off that way though. When I was a child, I loved Christmas. I was fired up Christmas, especially about receiving gifts at Christmas. My mom would remind me, she would say, Dave, you were so excited when you were a little guy about Christmas that on Christmas Eve, I would have to sleep on the floor outside your door because otherwise you would get up early and you'd start unwrapping your presents. I loved Christmas as a child, but I have to admit, once the gifts started to get a little more practical, once I got luggage for Christmas, my attitude about Christmas began to shift. But there was really a moment that changed it for me. My mom and I were Christmas shopping. We were in a department store and we had gotten in line to check out and the man in front of us had a cart full of toys. And he just had the biggest, happiest smile on his face. And I assumed he was a dad and he bought all these toys for his kids. And so I watched him just joyfully putting these toys up on the conveyor belt and watched the cashier add it all up. When the cashier gave him his total, his smile completely disappeared because he realized he didn't have enough money to pay for all those gifts. And so he told the cashier, he said, well, you know, take that one off and take that one off and take that one off, put them aside. And she would give him a new total and I could see that he still didn't have enough money. And then he would ask her to take a few more away and still didn't have enough. And this process went on for several rounds until finally the amount of gifts that he could not purchase was a lot bigger than the amount of gifts he was going to purchase. And I have to say something just snapped in me in my heart when I saw that happen. Now, some people would be led to be generous and say, how can I help someone who doesn't have enough for Christmas? But instead, you know what I did? I just went to cynicism. I just said, you know what? Christmas is an overhyped holiday. It brings out the materialism in all of us and I'm not into it. And that was the attitude I had in my family. I would critique Christmas and the traditions around it. When my mom would tell us right after Thanksgiving, she said, hey, go up in the attic, get all the Christmas decorations down. I would appeal to her. I'd say, mom, why are we going to all this effort? Why get all that stuff down, put it all up and we're just gonna take it down in less than a month. And my mom would say, Dave, get up in the attic and get the Christmas decorations down. (laughs) And then I would share my thoughts as I drove around town and I would see the stores put their Christmas displays up, which I think this year was probably about July 4th. (laughs) And I would say, what is the deal? What is the deal with the over commercialization of Christmas? I was a Grinch. I was not very much fun to be around. But then something happened. Something happened to me that completely changed the way that I view Christmas. It was dramatic. It was clear. And I'm going to tell you about it in a few moments. But what I realized through that moment was the thing that I had been missing when it came to Christmas was joy. I did not understand the power of joy. And have you noticed that there's a lot of joy in the Christmas story? We hear the word joy often in the Christmas story. In fact, right at the beginning in Luke chapter 1, we see Mary, who is now pregnant with Jesus, goes to visit her relative Elizabeth, who is pregnant with John the Baptist. And so Mary goes in and sees Elizabeth, and Mary speaks a greeting to her. And this is what Elizabeth says took place. Luke 1 verse 44. For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leapt in my womb for joy. Would you say the word joy? Isn't that amazing? Mary walks in, she says, hello, Elizabeth. And John the Baptist, as a babe in his mother, still leapt for joy. And then we see in Luke 2, as our kids did an amazing job, didn't they do incredible reciting Luke 2? Man, it's, it's humbling for all of us, 
but the power of memorizing God's word and the angel announcement that we heard in Luke 2 in verse 10. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid for behold, I bring you good news of great, of great joy, which will be for all the people. And then in Matthew 2, we read the wise men. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. That's exactly right. You've got great joy. Because exceedingly great joy means joy, 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 joy. Four times over joy. Joy is a powerful gift of Christmas. Do you have joy today? We know that it's good for us to have joy. The book of Proverbs tells us in Proverbs 17, verse 22, a joyful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. Listen to a couple of scholars on joy. Joy is the serious business of heaven. That's what C.S. Lewis said. I like this. Joy is an act of defiance. That's what Bono says about joy. In this negative critical world, to put our hope in God through joy, it's an act of defiance. So what does this joy mean? What is this joy that we sing about, that we talk about, that we read about? What does it mean? I think this is a good definition of joy. Joy is the deep down sense of well-being, a delight and inner rejoicing that abides in the heart of the person who knows all is well between himself and the Lord. To get joy, we have to get the power of God's grace. Let's do a little Greek word study for a moment. New Testament was written in Greek. The word for joy is the word kara. Some of you, your name is kara. Your name means joy. It's kara, joy. The word for grace, you can see it's in the same family as kares. So in order to get joy, you first of all have to get grace. What is grace? Grace is God's gift. God chose to come to the earth in the person of Jesus Christ. He chose to go to the cross for us. He has given us this amazing gift of salvation. It's a grace gift. It means you don't earn it. To a world full of earners, we like to earn every single thing that we do. Instead, he said, you can't earn it. You're never going to be good enough for me. But Jesus Christ, who is good enough, came for us. It's a gift of grace. So how do we get joy? We First of all, we get grace. God, you have so incredibly saved me. You have rescued me. Because you have rescued me, then the natural response is joy. What is joy? It's just gratitude for grace. But sometimes we can forget the power of his amazing grace, can't we? Sometimes we can forget how radically he has saved us and transformed us. When we get grace, when we remember grace, then we get joy and we walk in joy. The power of joy. There was a man who was a Jesus follower. He loved the Lord. He got joy. He was in the hospital battling a very, very serious illness. And after the nurse interacted with him, she wrote on his chart, the patient is inappropriately joyful. He's inappropriately joyful. In other words, he understood that joy is not bound by circumstances. It's not bound by what is going on. That's how that nurse defined it. Wouldn't you want that to be said about you and me, that we are inappropriately joyful people? Wouldn't that be wonderful if we walked out of this place with a deep desire in our heart that we are inappropriately joyful? In other words, even in the toughest of times, we still can have joy. How can we place our confidence in joy? We understand that God is the originator. He is the giver of joy. In Zephaniah 3, listen to this amazing picture. The Lord your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. He will exult over you with, he will quiet you in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of, the Lord our God is a warrior, a mighty warrior, but he's also a tender father. This passage is a picture of those of us who are in Christ. That means we are God's sons and we are his daughters. And the scripture is telling us, think about God, think on God, meditate on a God who scoops you up 
and holds you in love and shouts, shouts joy over you. A father who is so delighted in his child as you are delighted in your children that he holds that child with such joy in his heart. We can be confident in joy first of all because the Lord pursues us with his joy. The Lord your God as your father delights in you. He delights in you. We need to hear that today. We need to believe that today. We have joy because the Lord has joy in us. And listen to what Jesus Christ did. Hebrews 12 says it this way, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus Christ did not go to the cross out of duty for us. He didn't go to the cross even out of a great sense of responsibility or sacrifice for us. He went to the cross for joy. Because when he looks at us, those who he has rescued, we are his joy. You are his pride and his joy. How can we be so confident in joy? Because we have a God who gives joy to us and a God who takes joy in us. One of the things I've always so appreciated whenever our kids have a chance to do anything as they recited the scripture today is to watch you guys, to watch your faces. We see their faces, they're so sweet. But you know, mom and dad, grandparents, you're just beaming with joy because you're so proud of your kids. God in Jesus Christ came to this earth, purchased ransom you, rescued you out of joy. Our joy is in Jesus Christ who gives joy. But also we need to make sure that we are clear about this. That in the hard times of life, and sometimes Christmas magnifies these hard times, that grief, sorrow, grief and joy can exist at the same time. I was talking to a dear friend of mine the past couple weeks and he's experienced great loss, tragic loss, but he is a joy giver. He's a joy bringer and he is a joy believer in Jesus Christ. And he said, you know, I can experience grief and sadness and loss, but I also can experience the joy in Jesus Christ that he is with me, that he loves me, that he is caring for me. Jesus said it so clearly In John 16, we read, he has gathered together with his disciples. We talked about this last week in this farewell discourse. And he's just pouring his heart out to them. And he knows that the cross awaits him. He knows that cruel suffering awaits him. But he still wanted them to say, no matter how bad the suffering is, the joy can still be there. And he uses a metaphor that many of you ladies can understand. Verse 21 of John 16. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy the child has been born into this world. Moms, you get that. You get that. And he says this in verse 22. Therefore, too, therefore you too have grief now. But I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and no one will take your joy away from you. Jesus said it. He said, you can be so confident in suffering in hard times. You can still have great, great joy. And no one can take that joy away from us. No one can take that joy. Because it is a joy that he has given to us. We can walk in his joy. We can live in his joy. Because you get grace, you get joy. And why is joy so important? Why why couldn't we just say, hey, life is hard right now and I'm just going to let myself walk in that pain and just maybe say this is all there is for right now. Why, Why can't I just put my expectations so low for the Lord? Because if we're not walking in joy, we're walking in joylessness, which leads to cynicism and it causes us to hold back. When we're walking in joy, even when life is hard, we're loving people. 
We're forgiving people. We're serving people. When we're not walking in joy, we're playing defense. But how do we put this joy into practice? By practicing. Because our minds, being the sinners that we are, we are bent toward the negative, aren't we? I was reading a psychologist who said, our brains are much more like Velcro when it comes to negativity than Teflon when it comes to being positive. In other words, what does Velcro do? Things stick to Velcro, right? You hear a negative word, a negative message, someone says something negative about you, you're going through a negative circumstance and we just grab a hold of it. As opposed to something positive happening and, and it causes us to make the negativity go away. No, we hold on to the negative. We let those negative things imprint our minds. So how do we put it into practice? Paul wrote this from a prison. He said, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. We practice joy by choosing joy. It's a command and it's a choice. He says, I command you by the grace of God to practice joy. In other words, no matter what we're going through, we instead of saying, I'm gonna turn inward or I'm gonna turn my back, instead we look upward and we say, God, I'm choosing you. God, even when I don't have the answer, I'm gonna be joyful in you because you give me what I need. And what do we need? The gift of Christmas is him. Remember I said something happened to me that changed my view of Christmas? When I was in, when I was in my early 20s, a friend invited me to go to a Christmas program. And he said, Dave, this program is different. He said, we're gonna go to this banquet, which is really a graduation ceremony for this ministry that my family helps with. And it turned out that this Christmas program was a graduation for men and women who had been sober for a year. It was a drug and alcohol rehab program. And they had come through the program and now they were ready to graduate and take the next step of aftercare. And I said, man, I'd love to go. I'd love to see what's going on. And they did the most amazing thing. The program, I still remember it. They shared what all the different residents had gone through, but they brought each one up as part of the graduation ceremony. They presented them with a certificate and then they gave them a chance to share about a minute. And every single person had prepared their story so well. And there were a lot of commonalities in their stories. They said, we made some really terrible decisions, some terrible choices, maybe in response to pain they had, maybe things that they missed growing up, a lot of different background. But everyone said, we had gotten such darkness that we turned to a substance for addiction and we literally did not see a way out. And as person after person shared that, you began to get an understanding of just how hard life can be, how dark it can be. But they said because of their brokenness and in their brokenness that someone was kind enough, someone hung in there with them enough and pointed them to this program. And in the program, they heard about Jesus Christ. They heard about the giver of joy, the giver of new life. And person after person said, I've come to know Jesus Christ and he has changed me. And because he has changed me, I came into the program in darkness, but I'm gonna walk out in light. I'm gonna walk out in the love of God. And I have to tell you, as someone who was sitting there, who'd heard a lot of stories before, I was blown away. It was amazing grace in action. And then they did the thing that began to help me see Christmas. After the graduation was over, they said, we're gonna put a program on for you. And they lined up about 30 people now, they're a choir, and they began to sing worship songs of Christmas, just like we do. And as they began to sing with such unbridled joy, with such phenomenal joy, I began to believe it. Jesus Christ is so good that there's not a person, there's not a situation, there's not a story that he cannot redeem, that he cannot rescue. 
And as they sang these songs of Christmas joy with such sincere conviction, I was like, I get it, Lord. That's what Christmas is about. Ceremony is great. Tradition is great. But Christmas is the gift of Jesus Christ. And because Jesus has come, there is only one response that's worthy. And that is joy, 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 joy.